Welcome, everyone. Um, this is Annie Rogers, and I'm here to welcome you to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts broadcast today. We are extremely pleased to welcome um, Dr. Russell Ramsey and David Gwerk, who will be presenting today on two topics of great interest and importance to our audience, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, and uh, ADHD coaching. Um, as many of you know, these are typically the first non-medical treatments that are recommended to adults with attention deficit disorder. They share a lot of similarities and some very important differences to their approaches. So we'll be learning about those differences, um, the distinctions, as well as the similarities and some opportunities for combining uh, these two therapies into one. Um, so let me give a brief overview here of our experts joining us today. Um, Dr. Ramsey is the co-founder and co-director of the University of Pennsylvania's Adult ADHD Treatment and Research Program and Associate Professor of Clinical Psychology in Psychiatry in the University of Pennsylvania's Pierman School of Medicine. He has authored five books and numerous peer-reviewed professional and scientific articles, research abstracts, as well as many book chapters on issues related to adult ADHD specifically. Um, he's a member of CHAD, uh, the Hall of Fame there, serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Attention Disorders, and has served on the professional advisory boards for ADA, CHAD, Totally ADD, and is on the board of directors of APSARD and the scientific advisory board of Attitude, yours truly. Um, and David Gwerk, uh, MCAC, he is a master certified ADHD coach with the Professional Association of ADHD Coaches and master certified coach, MCC, with the International Coach Federation. He is also the founder and president of ADD Coach Academy, the first and largest comprehensive ADHD coach training program fully accredited by the ICF and PAAC, the governing bodies for life coaching and ADHD coaching professionals. He's a member of the International Ch Chad Hall of Fame as well, and has also received the coveted ADHD Coaches Organization Founders Award for his many contributions to the field of coaching and research. Um, we are very pleased to have them both here today um, in what is, I believe, our first um, sort of combined webinar where we're really doing a mashup of two um, different topics and explaining how they interplay. For that reason, um, I do want to note that today's webinar will be running a little longer than, than typical. We'll be going 90 minutes today. Um, if you are unable to listen for the full 90 minutes, please know that everyone who registered will receive a link at the end of, um, well, a couple of hours after the webinar is over, so where you can access um, the replay. Um, so along those lines, a couple more housekeeping items and we'll get into it. Um, if you're turning, tuning in live, um, to the webinar now, you may download the slides by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. Um, and if you are interested in a certificate of attendance, please look for instructions that will come via email about an hour after the broadcast. Again, you will also um, be able, to, oh, sorry, for those of you who are listening in uh, replay mode or podcast mode, please visit the webinar replay page on the Attitude website. And uh, that's attitudemag.com slash podcast dash 327 for access to the accompanying slides and certificate of attendance options. So with all of that out of the way, I am extremely pleased to turn the microphone over to Dr. Ramsey and Mr. Gwerk, and we will get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. You bet. This is Dr. Ramsey, and I'll handle the financial disclosures. But we figured neither one of us is as boring as both of us together. So that's right. Good luck. Um, our financial <laughs> disclosures are listed there. Um, the only we each have one pharmaceutical industry disclosure. Uh, David with Tris Pharma and me with Iron Shores Pharmaceuticals. Both of us um, providing education on the non-medication treatment of ADHD. And 
in terms of what we hope to get done today, again, uh, we're friends from way back and we've talked about our mutual interest in ADHD coaching and CBT. So really giving definitions of understanding them and how they can provide help for adults with ADHD. Uh, background on the respective training and credentialing people in both professions go through. Similarities and overlaps in terms of helping uh, adults with ADHD make desired changes and not only getting better, but also flourishing and how they complement each other and just even some examples of working together. So David will start off with um, an overview of ADHD coaching. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. I'm very excited to be here. And uh, I just like to, oh, something isn't working here. Oh, do you want me to move it? Yeah, would you, Russ? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to. All right. So just to give you a context, Russ and I have known each other for about uh, 20 years. And um, we first decided, and actually this might be including Sweden, Russ, this might be our seventh or eighth time over many years presenting this. So we've had the, um, uh, you know, the privilege of seeing both our professions evolve and broaden. Um, and in the case of coaching, get more research, which we'll talk about. But first and foremost, ADHD coaching is a client-centered process. It's a collaboration, like a joint venture between two people where they're working together on an equal basis to empower that person to create their own agenda, to create their own focus for the session. And it's 100% focused on that client and their needs. And it's about the whole person. Something that I think is really important here to, to emphasize is you see that distinction that we use the what versus the who. And a lot of life coaching and in a lot of other kinds of therapies, <clears throat> excuse me, it's the focus on what they can do, what they can do better. It's about performance. It's about productivity. And what we know about ADHD coaching is that ADHD coaches have an ADHD lens. You're going to see that word a lot today. And the ADHD lens is about understanding that who that client is is not what they have or haven't done. Who that client is is based on their unique brain wiring and what inspires them to move forward. It's not enough to just be interested in something because ADHD coaching is not only about activating their brain in a positive way, it's about sustaining their energy and focus to complete projects, to put that energy forth to accomplishing other things. And the coach partners uh, with the client by inviting them and encouraging them to go out, you know, to get out of their comfort zone. And we do that by having a focus on strengths. Now, in ADHD coaching, we just don't focus on performance strengths. We focus on what's called character strengths. And um, this is a kind of strength that actually was developed at the University of Pennsylvania, where Russ works, um, in the positive psychology program by Martin Seligman. Now, before those character strengths came out, the VIA character strengths, we had another method of identifying the motivation, the sources of inspiration that made that client who they were. So in other words, you can't coach somebody uh, with ADHD, for that matter, that doesn't have ADHD, but even more so with ADHD, to move forward in a particular area of their lives unless they understand what makes up the essence of who they are. What are the personality characteristics and what are the sources of motivation and inspiration? And like Russell Barkley and Tom Brown, they say one of the biggest challenges of ADHD is self-awareness and growth. Well, if we define self-awareness in the coaching way, in the coaching way in language, it's pausing to pay attention to what you're paying attention to and challenging what you're paying attention to because you have no idea what that is that you are actually paying attention to. Because people with ADHD don't have the self-awareness and they don't have the inhibitory skills, the ability to pause and pay attention in the moment and then take that in. And that's because they have challenges with emotional regulation. So you can notice that even these life coaching kinds of attributes have to have that ADHD lens. And that ADHD lens is an understanding of the behaviors, the traits, the strengths, and the weaknesses. It's a balanced approach. But you don't activate. And when we say activate, I'll use that word a lot. We're not just talking about igniting the brain. Because if we define 
interest as anything that activates the brain, things that are of a negative nature, you know, pessimistic program, perfectionism can also activate the brain too because it's the dominant program. That's what Russ works on too, is helping that person identify those dominant programs that could be creating a negative neurology and moving them forward. Well, one of the big differences between ADHD coaching and CBT and other kinds of therapies is that we work on positive activation of the brain by finding out the sources that make that person who they are so they can access those a bit more and create positive emotion, not manage negative emotion, because that's what we learn. So standing on that foundation, strong foundation, like building a house, if you don't have a strong foundation in the house, as soon as a big storm comes by, it's going to knock the whole house down. That's why life coaches have no business coaching people with ADHD, because the first thing we have to do is educate them about their ADHD. How does their ADHD show up in terms of situational variability? meaning every situation has the ability to change the perspective and the energy and the ability of that person to pay attention. When the situation is of positive nature and something that they know do, do well, they can move forward. But if they don't identify those situations, they're in trouble. Okay? And we, we have to be able to acknowledge the person with ADHD not as a person that's broken, but as a person who has a unique brain wiring, look, uh, all of us as human beings have trillions of ways we process information, trillions. And somehow the world has told us we have to find two or three at work or at school. And if we don't find those two or three and we don't do them well, we're a failure. It's just not true that people with ADHD have a unique brain wiring and we have to help them and support them with customized systems that work the way their brain works so they can manifest and reach those desired outcomes. Next one, okay. We have to ask important questions. You know, coaching is a process of collaboration that understands the unique brain wiring, but it creates an automatic pause. People with ADHD, because of their inhibitory problems, they react, they don't respond. They don't pause in the moment to identify what's going on and they're just not aware. So we ask evocative questions, like, for example, when we mirror back to our clients, language that they're telling us that they're not even aware. So what I'm hearing you tell me is that you don't think you're good at anything, that there's nothing you do well, it's black and white, it's pervasive. And when we mirror that back to them, they'll say things like, did I say that? And he said, yeah. I wrote it down. You actually said it. And we'll ask them a, an evocative question that sounds so simple that they've never heard before. How is what you are paying attention to serving you? How is it serving your ability to meet your desired outcome? So we ask questions that take them out of their comfort zone, but they're based on a new self-awareness because many of them are verbal processors. They process out loud and they need a coach to mirror it back to them. We have to identify and integrate Sources of positive emotion. The default mechanism that all human beings have, but especially those with ADHD, is a negativity bias, which means the dominant programs that we pay attention to, and this is even more pervasive with ADHD, is the weakness, the problem, rather than the possibilities and then the ability to move forward. This is why, and by the way, from a biological perspective, because ADHD coaches understand neuroscience, and we, we integrate that into our work. What neuroscience tells us that when we pay attention to negative dominant programs, those thoughts and those programs which Russ works on can create negative neurochemicals that stay in the body and the brain for 24 hours. One of them being cortisol, which creates more stress. We don't wanna go there because ADHD individuals, adults especially go there even more. We want to shift that attention and get them to pay attention to their successes, accessing memory that's related to that so they can positively activate their brain and create neurochemicals by what they pay attention to, like oxytocin, which is the love bonding chemical. But guess what? That only stays in your body and your brain for six hours. That's why people don't understand you have to work that much harder to create positivity and have prompts to remember that. And lastly, 
but most importantly, in a compassionate, kind way, we hold our clients responsible, not accountable, responsible. There's a different accountable is a term that um, conveys a pressure a pressure to perform even in arenas that they're not well suited for. Responsibility means that the coach and the client have discussed what is their ability to respond, that they've made a choice based on their own integrity of who they are, that based on knowing what motivates them, based on agreeing in partnership with the coach, this is what I want to pursue. And coach, please help me, empower me, to go after what naturally activates my brain and the unique brain wiring that I possess and manifest that. Okay, Russ. Okay. What is CBT particularly adapted for adult ADHD? So cognitive behavioral therapy, people will often ask in general, how is this different than classic psychotherapy. Well, it is a form of psychotherapy. You're sitting in a room talking with somebody or these days looking at your computer lens, talking with somebody on their computer lens. But it is a doctor-patient, doctor-client relationship, however you want to form, uh, describe it. And it's a collaborative one. Uh, it, it, now, this can be general CBT as well as for ADHD but collaborating with a focus on helping clients achieve personally defined goals. What do you want to get out of this? Working towards an end, usually in the form of some sort of symptom relief, behavioral change, functional improvement, and or improved overall well-being. Uh, and that's one of the points I make about ADHD, the cognitive behavioral therapy for ADHD. We're really not focused on the official symptoms I'm not telling people, okay, look at my nose, pay attention for 10 seconds, take a break. Let's see if we can get it up to 15. No, it's the procrastination. It's the time management. It's the, the effects on adult role functioning out there in the real world. That's where we want to make a difference. Now, part of the adaptation of cognitive behavioral therapy, it was an existing form of psychotherapy before it was adapted for ADHD. It developed as a treatment for depression, first and foremost. And psychoeducation is part of CBT in general, but also even more so for ADHD. Understanding not just, oh yeah, you procrastinated again, you have to try harder not to procrastinate. No, it's understanding, and I think this overlaps with coaching a bit, how the brain works, the executive function self-regulation model of ADHD, to under, understand how do you procrastinate? How does disorganization keep happening? And that framework, once you have the framework for understanding it, now you have a framework or a template or a blueprint for change. And in training other professionals, uh, uh, trainee clinicians or other professionals, uh, behavioral health care therapists who want to get training in this, we're also giving a model for treatment that can be replicated by others and people can be trained in. So understanding part of the how you don't do things, understanding that is being able to recognize patterns, attribute it to ADHD, and also have a, t uh, a model for change um, and maintenance of gains. The relapse rate for procrastination is 100%, so you will procrastinate. Everybody procrastinates, 20% of the population has problematic pro procrastination, and I would bet a, a big percentage of that is, uh, there's an overrepresentation of ADHD in there. Um, so the maintenance and being able to get back on track after we invariably slip up is part and parcel of the treatment for ADHD. So with this being a form of psychotherapy, there are psychosocial interventions informed by cognitive science, the effect of thinking, mindsets, framing on how we approach things. You don't think yourself into having ADHD, but living with ADHD, particularly if it's gone undiagnosed, it's going to color the lens through which you see the world, including um, deeper held beliefs about our sense, our sense of self, the schema or the core beliefs, which again, we describe as lenses through which we interpret what's going on around us. Behavioral 
strategies for change. There's no trade secrets about managing ADHD. Everybody knows them and knows what will work. ADHD is an implementation problem. And part of the self-regulation difficulties associated with ADHD that don't show up anywhere in the official diagnostic criteria are the emotional regulation or the emotional discontrol problems. And those are worthy of direct intervention. There are many acceptance and persistence types of interventions that focus on recognizing being discomfort free or having perfectly well-balanced self-esteem. If we hold these up as necessary preconditions of getting things done or engaging in coping strategies, man, if these were a precondition for me today, I wouldn't have shown up for work because I would have been low on all those things. It's how do you engage do what you need to do, cope well, um, tolerate setbacks, understand from them, and persist over the long haul. And hopefully our net gain is in the desired direction. And that also ties in with um, interventions from implementation research. And one of the lesser renowned areas of difficulty with ADHD and also potential influence is the interpersonal domain or your um, interpersonal collateral for self-advocacy as well as for role fulfillment. And all of these draw on some form of evidence base. And not to mention just dealing with general psychotherapy issues. Sometimes I'll be sitting across from somebody and we'll be setting, setting the agenda for that day's session. And somebody will say, oh, I had a difficult interaction with my teenage son today. Oh yeah, but you're my ADHD therapist. This isn't an ADHD thing. No, I don't want people editing themselves and saying, oh, yes, you have to go see your parenting adolescent son therapist for that problem. No, that gets woven in. And we could probably make a, a tangential stretch that, hey, maybe that does relate to ADHD and frustration tolerance or whatever. But it does come from a, a general psychotherapy framework that can be helpful for other matters, um, including relationships personal choices, decision-making about school, work, dealing with the common comorbidities of ADHD, not limited to the symptoms only. And going back to even the spirit of CBT back when it was developed as a treatment for depression, collaborative empiricism. It, it's a collaboration, sitting shoulder by shoulder, sort of seeing what your mindset is, what your assumptions are, and can we test these assumptions? Let's gather the data. I just know this won't work out for me. Well, that, that's fortune telling. What makes you think it won't work out? Are there any skills we can focus on? And are you willing to do the experiment to see if we can do something different and how it turns out? And even if it doesn't turn out well, it doesn't mean that the plan was wrong. Maybe there, wasn't, there was something we didn't factor in. This involves accurate empathy. And I think the therapeutic alliance in CBT in general is often underappreciated. And I think it's especially important working with adults with ADHD, sitting across and with somebody who gets it, who sort of understands the difficulties associated with ADHD and the benefit and why CBT was um, probably the first psychotherapy attempted to be modified for ADHD. It's inherent structure in sessions, the focus on between sessions, homework tasks, action plans, experiments, and helping people. It's the right of self-determination, making informed decisions. You may choose to procrastinate or get started on something and say, it ain't happening today. That's okay. We want you to make informed decisions um, that uh, help you increase the efficacy you have in your life. Oh, and the goal is to make treatment sticky, portable skills that you can use outside the consulting room or when you log off the remote meeting. And the goal ultimately is make the therapist obsolete. These are skills that you can do, even though with ADHD, maybe people do benefit from ongoing booster meetings like monthly, quarterly, whatever, and maybe increasing during times of stress. All right. Oh, there we go. Okay. So what ADHD coaching is not? First of all, you know, coaches, when we meet our clients, uh, there is a structure to it. 
but the structure of the coaching session is Oops. about listening to what's working, but we also have to have a balanced approach and listen to what's not working. And we can't diagnose, but what we can do and what we do really well is we can hear what's going on and empower that client to realize. So what I'm hearing you say is that even though it's sunny outside and you won the New York State lottery, you can't get out of bed and you know, have no motivation. Well, we wouldn't use the word depression, but what we would do is help them understand that despite the fact that there are good things happening in their lives, they don't have the energy or the motivation to get out of bed to start their day. That could be another form of depression or whatever you call it, but we wouldn't use those terms. What we would do is we would offer to give them a referral to a CBT therapist, a diagnostician like a psychiatrist, because we don't know, is this a cognitive issue or a biological issue or both? So many times coaches have clients that are coming to them that have not gone to a therapist, have not gone to a psychiatrist, have read a book, and they think they may have it. And what we do is we empower them to listen to the language, listen to the symptoms and the strengths. But in this case, if what's impeding their ability to move forward is like a can't, I can't do it, rather than I won't do it, then we're going to refer out. We're not going to stay with that client until they have the balance and support that they need to move on with the coaching. An ADHD coach from a good accredited program that's certified has this understanding of the brain and a biopsychosocial perspective. It's not just the biology. It's not just the psychology. It's the comprehensive understanding of the human being in front of you and how their ability is how they're um, able to move forward in important areas of life or are not able to. And if they're stuck and they can't shift out of it, then we're going to refer. Now, with that said, there are other things that we might be able to work with the client on. But what we're going to do is say you need to develop a strong biological foundation because what I'm hearing you say is you're stuck. You can't. It's not you won't. You can't. That's a big distinction. Can't versus won't. And we will refer them to a therapist or a counselor or or a, a psychiatrist in, in this particular case. So what we do is we listen to the language very carefully. And because they're not self-aware, and self-awareness is so low because of the inhibitory challenge, that inhibition, that inability to pause and stop in the moment and filter out all the distractions, we're there to give them the clear understanding of what they're sharing with us so they can hear it maybe for the first time and then support them in going out and getting a proper diagnosis. We all know that diagnosis is very difficult in this world, and there are not a lot of well-trained CBT therapists, ADHD coaches, nor are there a lot of well-trained psychiatrists that have a specialty in the diagnosis of ADHD, and that includes therapy. We do, and there's not enough of us. So the referral base that we have has to be one that we know that the person we're sending them to is specifically trained in the diagnosis and treatment of ADHD. All right. And David, as an FYI, moving ahead. Whoops, I'm going to put yep. forward um, all the all the um, the slides because we're at our scoop and go set. Yep. Yep. Um, so what CBT is not? It's not a casual relationship, and professionally, um, there's an ethical prohibition of having dual relationships. So I could not treat my family. Um, I could not treat Dave Gwerk. Um, I could not treat anybody who there might be at least the appearance of any sort of conflict that might, and it's meant to protect clients and patients, that they're not put in the situation where they don't feel comfortable telling me, hey, you're not helping me. I think I need something else. Um, and, and so there are more strict rules about who we can accept as clients, uh, or not, maybe not rules or prohibitions about who we cannot. 
And once somebody is a client, there are certain limitations on moving ahead, like not dating clients and all these seemingly commonsensical things. But sometimes it can get a little hairier, like in a small community. It is not the power of positive thinking um, with a qualification. It started as a treatment of depression. So people who are depressed tend to be more negative about themselves, the world, and pessimistic about the future. So in part of the adaptive counterbalancing, there may be more of a positive edge to it. But, you know, David mentioned um, the New York State lottery. What did Voltaire say about gambling? It's taxation on poor probability skills. Uh -huh. Gam gamblers are very positive thinkers. Um, so we were looking at adaptive reasoned thinking, taking into account everything, including where we might be reading into where we don't have e evidence yet. It's also not a mechanical set of techniques like programming a robot. You just do this. It is part of a relationship and empathizing and summarizing and trying to see the world through the client's eyes. Um, not that we can ever do that perfectly, but that, em that empathic attunement. And it's not venting or just a paid friendship who goes, yeah, you're right. Everybody else is out there is wrong. Um, it is now there can be sharing of strong emotions, but it's also channeled through, okay, how can you use those emotions? How much of it is excessive? A little bit of guilt can be a helpful emotion <laughs> too much. Not so much. All our emotions are information. There's adaptive, you know, the capacity to feel sadness. Anxiety is helpful. The negativity bias that David mentioned before, it comes from research by the social psychologist Roy Baumeister. There is a book out now called The Power of Bad. That reflex negativity, a reasonable dose of that is healthy because it helps us anticipate problems, come up with solutions, maybe avoid problems. But the difficulty is, and, and we tend to minimize if something works out well, it's really easy to go, well, that's the way it's supposed to go. I had a good day at work. Well, that's my job. That's what I'm supposed to do. Um, and so I think with ADHD, helping adults with ADHD, reinforcing incremental gains. Yeah, I know you're supposed to get to work on time, but that's been a goal of yours. Let's give yourself credit and look back at what you did to make that happen today. Um, so it is a very special alliance that because it's special, it's not the type that you're going to get elsewhere in your life. Okay, so as we go through this uh, quickly, this critique, I just want to make uh, something very clear. This is, you know, a coaching perspective on how CBT and therapy in general is different than coaching. So first and foremost, CBT is more of a problem focused. Uh, you know, where's the impairment? Where's the problem? Where's the negativity? And ADHD coaching is just the complete opposite. It's about oh, where David, are that's your... all or nothing thinking. I got to call you if I had a buzzer. Okay. All or nothing. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and that's right. Black and white. It's all or nothing. And so what we're talking about, and I'm really glad Russ did that because um, there's the difference. Is it's not black and white. There is this open invitation for possibilities, but you cannot go for possibilities in the future if you don't know what makes you tick in the present, what motivates you, and you don't know what motivates you unless you can create positive emotion because emotion is what activates in a positive way the brain. And that means even if you know those sources, you still have to have strengths to pursue them, strengths to act on them. And we look at four different kinds of strengths. In CBT, I think that the strengths may be sort of an afterthought. It comes up. But again, it's this who versus what. Tell me what inspires you to get out of bed every day and act on that picture in your head. And the terminology, you can see the difference in terminology between what Russ is using and I'm using. You know, maladaptive behavior, limiting thoughts, cognitive distortions. Um, I don't know if this is true still, Russ, but I think that in CBT they may even refer to um, – the individuals they work with as patients. We refer to them as clients. And in fact, we even refer to them as coachees now. We've taken it, it's that sense of partnership, working together in collaboration, understanding what's gonna move you forward. And then, you know, 
CBT is about the compensatory strategies, you know, working on automatic negative thoughts. Now, I have to say this is very, very important, and we will send our clients, our coaches, to CBT therapists, but only after we've tried the activating piece first. Very often they'll get stuck, and if they get stuck, maybe with the coaching session we can get them out of it. But if the behavior and the actions are, are of a client are not um, moving them forward, I'm going to send them to a CBT therapist. That's not what a coach is going to look at. We're going to hear it. We're not going to focus on it. But if it's an impediment, we're going to send them to the therapist. And not all patients are ready for therapy. Quite often, I think one of the differences uh, between CBT and coaching is the hierarchical um, structure of CBT is perceived as the therapist fixing the client. They're coming in for the solution. They're coming in and the therapist is going to give me all the answers. That's not what coaching is about. Coaching is empowering that person to understand how their ADHD manifests, understand how their brain wiring works. So once they do that, they can begin to see, I'm not broken. There are ways that my brain works differently. My coach is inviting me to look at those ways to move forward rather than looking at the problems um, in my diagnosis, the problems that define um, impulsivity, inattention, hyperactivity, emotional regulation, those issues where they can't move forward. We, on the other hand, are looking at it and saying, you know who you are, and we're here to help you explore and discover that. And it's really done through something that's very important called memory, contextual memory. We'll talk about that in a second. But quite often, because ADHD is a challenge of memory, what coaches are doing, as opposed to maybe a therapist, is not going back and revisiting the negative emotions and the negative memory. It's doing just the opposite. Tell me the times when you express your creativity and kindness. Tell me what experience that was and share that with me. Now, that's very often hard for people with ADHD to access that. And in coaching, what we do is we empower them through the use of character strengths, through the use of prompts, through the use of positive emotions and clues and evidence that they know they can use to, into their memory and access a specific event or situation that may have been buried. So rather than excavating the negative out, we're excavating the positive and reinforcing it over and over and over. In terms of on my side, um, just critiques or questions. And I certainly appreciate in the time I've known David and I've gotten an insider's view on some of these changes and and just you know, sharing some of the things that we're discussing today, these some of these questions have been or are being answered, and I think I've updated this, but one of my concerns as an outsider is the gatekeeping, the admission screening, the training and the quality control, because one of the things there are many training facilities, and that is, uh, uh, you know, which is necessary. Hey, University of Pennsylvania makes people pay tuition. Um, but with ADHD being a new profession, there's like, what is the gatekeeping? What's the bar for a gatekeeping and admissions? And is there a shared standard? Um, the general, the business versus the academic healthcare ethos. So in, and I think somewhere transparency, open versus proprietary information. Any research we do gets published, our manuals get published, and yeah, if they're, you know, if they are, you know, there's a fee, uh, yeah, I get royalties for books, but there's also things published and workshops and ways people can get at least introduced to what we're doing at various levels, whereas, you know, with, with coaching, there may be more of concern about one approach getting out there versus others. The ongoing oversight of the profession. I mentioned some of the ethical standards I operate under. I, you know, I could be sued for malpractice and there are certain training things I have to do to be able to call myself a psychologist and other people cannot call themselves a psychologist, though they could call themselves a psychotherapist because that's not a licensed profession. And, and also what can be a fuzzy line between coaching and treatment 
and and somebody like Dave who could work it's some it's probably not people on this on this webinar but um who how is that line navigated and how well do people avoid going over too far one way or the other um and sometimes people may be overselling their background or their training or building on the good reputation that adult ADHD coaching has in the field now because it's maybe not, it's not a licensed title at this time people can piggyback on it um and maybe take advantage of it and and all this is about protecting consumers um and then there's also the question about licensed therapists psychologists as coaches without actual coaching training because one of the criticisms about CBT in its early days from the classic psychotherapist was this is more of an a coaching encouraging situation in a way at that time it was viewed as too much of a positive relationship um but how much how much does CBT trained uh, CBT training and practice actually overlap with with coaching and that's sort of like a mutual critique not just on the coaching but also on yeah. CBT and people who call themselves coaches absolutely um so Oops, we're gonna uh, we're gonna go through this relatively quickly because there's other important things related to the skill sets and the competencies that we both use but just to give you an understanding of the history and the philosophy of coaching I've been a coach for over 25 years, and, and I have to say I've had the honor and privilege of seeing the evolution of ADHD coaching um, that really came out of, you can see up here, uh, you know, going back to Carl Rogers as a therapist and, um, you know, going into uh, understanding logotherapy by Viktor Frankl, which is therapy based on meaning. And uh, But what it really did is taking that therapeutic background um, and putting the choice and actions of the coaching conversation and the ability to move forward with an agenda in their lives based on appreciative inquiry, inquiring from a place of appreciation, inquiring from a place of strength, implying from a place of positive emotion, and uh, you know, inquiring from a place of what's working, inquiring from a place that creates that positive activation in the brain and um, also uh, from the new field of positive psychology uh, that Martin Seligman started at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, we have collaborated. Now, before positive psychology was positive psychology, we were doing, um, as coaches, we were doing a form of positive psychology where many of the interventions that are promoted in positive psychology are actually being customized and we've been customized in ADHD coaching, but we didn't have the evidence or the research to back it up. Now, since we've collaborated with the, the VIA Character Institute and done research, Russ and I've done research together on what are the attributes or strengths, character strengths of adults with ADHD, we've been able to um, accelerate the growth and understanding of individuals with ADHD from a positive perspective. There's not a lot of research out there that focuses on the attributes of ADHD individuals and adults. Most of the research is on pathology. So it was very clear to me early on as a coach and who started and founded a training program that the focus on impairments and the focus on the uh, symptoms of ADHD uh, like inattention, distractibility, impulsivity, the inability to uh, pause and make good decisions and critical thinking, and emotional regulation, which are huge issues that were not even in the, in the DSM-5. These were issues that um, impaired the ability of clients to move forward. But we also, in coaching, realized that in life coaching, that if you were a life coach who did not have an understanding of the ADHD brain, who did not have an understanding of the way adults with ADHD process information, take information, um, how hyper-focus, which is perceived as a weakness, can be a strength in the right situation, that in life coaching, coaches who were coming out of an accredited program, accreditation is one of the ways that we monitor training, but there's very few accredited coach training programs. There's only two or three in the world, and we're one of them, and our standards are very, very high. 
So I will encourage you as we're going through and understanding the foundation of coaching, coaching came out of a place of accreditation, a place of science, a place of research, at least the coaching that coaches that come out of the ADD Coach Academy and an accredited coach training program. We're the biggest and the largest, but we can only put out about 100 good coaches a year. And when you think that there's close to 350 million people worldwide that potentially have this disorder that are not undiagnosed, that's not a lot of whole people. But the coaches that are out there, just like the good CBT therapists that are trained in CBT and an understanding of ADHD, it's that ADHD lens that differentiates life coaching from ADHD coaching. And it was through the accredited training and what we observed in life coaching that we saw that life coaches cannot and should not and even the ICF, which is the head life coaching organization, refers people to our coaches and our program. By the way, we're one of the few programs that also promote certified coaches. Be careful. Be very careful. And you're going, one thing we've learned through the evolution of ADHD coaching, do not hire a coach that says they're certified, not from an accredited school, because that certification may be formed in-house. We, on the other hand, have been vetted and uh, you know our content been vetted by two of the world's largest accrediting bodies and we took sometimes two and a half years to get accredited by one body and now we're accredited there is an accrediting organization that does hold the standards of ADHD coaching called the professional association of ADD coaches now understand Russ has seen this evolution it was Russ's uh, advice and counseling to me as a coach that led me to not only try to get more research, but led me to work and struggle very hard to be one of the co-founders of an accredited body that held the ethics and standards of ADHD coaching. But even with that body, understand that not all training programs have been approved and accredited by those organizations that set the standards and ethics. Okay, attendees, take your Dramamine because we're going to be racing through some of these. Um, <laughs> quite, quite quickly, um, cognitive behavioral therapy was the father of CBT is considered Dr. Aaron Beck at Penn, um, who turned 99 this year and is publishing, it just published um, his treatment manual for the cognitive therapy of schizophrenia. And, you know, relative to a theme here, what he found in working with these, and often people have been hospitalized for a long time, the, the cognitive therapy focuses on identifying and building upon existing strengths um, in terms of the, the cognitive theme, finding there are defeatist beliefs from, I mean, it is an impairing psychiatric condition, but that by focusing on the strengths that is leading to peer reviewed research, you know, outcome studies of improvements and people underestimate how revolutionary cognitive therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy was at the time when Dr. Beck started researching it and developing it in the 1960s, 70s, even to now. At the time, Freudian psychoanalysis and strict behavioral modi modification therapies were the main therapy options, both of which required the expert therapist, the Viennese trained psychoanalyst, kidding a little bit there, um, or the strict <laughs> empirical behavior therapist showing you, okay, I have to set up your behavior program. Dr. Beck viewed recognizing, uh, in an all too brief nutshell, your cognitions, where they may be awry or incomplete or whatever, that's something somebody could be oriented to do and then go out and do on their own. So it was meant to be very empowering in that way. And that's why so many self-help books are maybe more CBT oriented and, um, you know, in some ways why it came at the time there were more uh, managed health care agencies requiring time limited treatment. And you could say whether that's a blessing or a curse in terms of CBT, but that there were more specific manuals, not just for therapists. Part of the Beck initiative is training some various levels of professionals like psychiatric nurses and whatnot to be able to do some of these interventions. It's really being able to make treatment more accessible. And even going back further, 1896, Leitner uh, Whitmer at the University of Pennsylvania, the um, 
oh, I forget what he called it, the, the counseling center or the counseling clinic, uh, the therapy clinic, the, uh, the psychology clinic, that's what it was, I'm sorry, was the first person to use in print the phrase clinical psychology. The ethic of it was using the science of psychology to alleviate human suffering. And probably the first client, and going back to patient person versus client, it's not across the board. I think for me, it, it might be the setting. I work in a medical school, so I'm around a lot of real doctors. Um, so sometimes it's just, it's it's not as well thought out by that. And I know most private practitioners, and most of the time we just call, call somebody Joe. That I just call all my clients <laughs> Joe. It's just making it easier. Middle, middle age working memory. It just helps me keep it straight. No, but he was the first one talking about using the science of psychology to relieve human uh, suffering. So it's based on a behavioral health care model. I mean, we're not kicking people out the door after five meetings saying, okay, you're on your own. This should be enough. There is that relationship and ADHD might require having that relationship at least as a touchstone. And it's based on, you know, it's an evidence supported treatment based on peer reviewed research treatment manuals. And there's just a bunch of levels of training people go through before reaching, be it psychologist, LCSW, whatever licensed therapy um, profession somebody achieves, there's usually a lot of gatekeeping that people will go to before getting to a lot of vetting before that point, before they can practice independently. Hold on. Okay, we're going to go through this relatively quickly because we have some other slides that we really want to go um, go through. So um, just to understand, there are three levels of credentialing in ADHD coaching. A at the academy, you get a, a, a certified through an accredited training program, and that makes you eligible to receive a credential from one of the other two accrediting organizations. A certification is a globalized, recognized um a credential that you have demonstrated a specific set of competencies or skills um, to empower an individual with ADHD to move forward in their lives. And that requires, a, you know, a bunch of training. At the uh, advanced level, which is the PCAC, Professional Certified um, ADHD Coach, it's two to, to four years of good, solid training um, you know, 150 to 250 hours of training. It means about, you know, six to eight practicums, a number of recordings which are reviewed using behavioral markers and um, standards for each of the competencies. And it requires about 500 hours of coaching. Now that's going to change. And there's going to be even more, a stronger requirement by the accrediting organizations to do more recordings, more demonstrations of the coaching and more review than is now. And, and that's right now is quite a bit, but we, we are going to um, broaden that. And instead of <clears throat> maybe more client coaching hours, we're going to seek the evidence of the demonstration of working with a client in a disciplined coaching conversation that empowers the both of them, but mostly the client, to move forward in collaboration in important areas of life um, customizing systems and structures that work the way their unique brain wiring works. That's the essence of what is to be demonstrated in a coaching session. And the essence of that and the essence of the training is not focusing on what they have to do, focusing on the source of motivation and inspiration that will sustain their ability to use those strengths. And this is what the training um, does. Now, for a professional certified coach, that means all these things. I happen to be a master certified coach, which means I had to do 2,500, 2,500, and mine took considerably more years. Um, it's not an academic, a higher academic kind of learning. It's an experiential learning, but I can assure you the content is based on scientific research and actual research, coaching research that the academy has conducted. So it's evolved. It's evolved. And these standards are very high but not every coach that has a credential next to their name has gone through this kind of training. Quickly, um, there are many licensed therapists. I'm a psychologist, four years undergraduate, 
four to five years typically in a PhD or a PsyD graduate program. You can see I have it there for the social work. I mean, it can be go longer, usually due to the dissertation. Um, at least two years, at the very least, probably like two and a half years between your pre-doctoral internship, your postdoctoral fellowship, and then during the graduate school years, you're doing some part-time clinical work while you're still uh, getting training, supervised hours. And that's even before getting any sort of special certification in CBT. I did a postdoctoral fellowship at the Center for Cognitive Therapy with before ADHD was even on my radar screen. Um, and along the, along the graduate training, you get exposed to other psychotherapy models. So like uh, logotherapy, Adlerian therapy, Rogerian, all these things, Freudian therapy, not that you specialize in them, but you get exposed to different models of behavior change. Tell you what, we'll each just okay. scoop, scoop and speak about like one or two of these. Yeah, just certification is a global recognition of your ability to demonstrate the coaching skills. And if they come from an accredited program, that's the credential that matters. And then there's different designations. We don't have to go through those. You can look at those on either the PAC site or the ICF. But the importance of this is a certification is a global designation. We don't have uh, licensing. What we have is certification from accredited organizations. That is our form of licensing in the coaching profession. It's not done state by state. It's done internationally through one organization. And the standards are very, very high to go through depending on the one of the three levels, the basic, the advanced, or the master that you go for. That credential, when you put it next to your name in the coaching profession, uh, means that you've done exceptionally high standard training. You've demonstrated the skills and learned the skills to conduct yourself as a professional ADHD coach. Yeah, for uh, CBT, well, this isn't just about CBT. It's sort of about the profession that many uh, people uh, get trained in CBT to practice. You know, different levels of school, your undergraduate college, your graduate program go through some sort of accreditation with APA, American Psychological Association accreditation for graduate programs and the pre-doctoral internships is the ideal. The most important thing is probably the state license, being licensed in your profession. There are different licensed professions, a physician, um, a, 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 a hairstylist or whatever the correct term would be. Uh, you know, they'll have the, like their license. It depends on the state, but that is meant to make sure that people can call themselves, in my case, a psychologist, that the public can know and, and they can access your information from the state licensing board, that there's some accountability there, that this person has been vetted through training, national and state licensing exams and continued education in the field. And then there can be further credentialing within CBT, like board certification. As I mentioned before, psychologist is a licensed um, position. You can't call yourself a psychologist if you don't have a license, at least not legally. Um, really quickly, two governing bodies, International Coach Federation for Life Coaching, but the governing body for the profession of ADHD coaching is the Professional Association of ADHD Coaches, which has existed about 10 years. But it's really in the last five years since they changed the review process and come up, came up with the coaching competencies or essentials that define the ADHD coaching profession that that accrediting body, the awareness has grown and the number of certified coaches is growing as well. All I have to say is just in addition to the previous slide, after now in practice, also governed by HIPAA, health laws, and other state and national health care laws. And there is a, a new organization, SIPACT, um, which is looking for a, an so, uh, you You can only practice psychology in the state in which you are licensed. And wherever the client is sitting, that is where practice is happening. Well, guess what? With COVID and um, the remote therapies, um, many states have loosened those restrictions. And SIPACT was in, in play before, but is looking for a group of states that would agree after somebody is vetted that they can practice remotely in those other states. Ethics, again, there is a governing body for the ethics uh, complaints that go through. If it was life coaching, it would go through the ICF. In terms of ethics and regulations, every coach before they get a credential is required to sign 
a pledge to the ethics, one of which is confidentiality. And there are ethical standards which are spelled out by both organizations, which a coach is bound by. And they sign that pledge uh, in each of these organizations. And if there's a violation of those, they can re be reported to the, 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 the standards board um, and brought before and can lose their credential if, in fact, uh, there's evidence to support the complaint. In terms of a psychologist, the APA standards I mentioned before, including the APA ethical guidelines. Um, one of the things about the, um, if you will, the doctor-patient relationships in CBT <clears throat> um, is information is confidential. It's legally protected, except in cases as a mandated reporter, whether there's evidence of child abuse, if there's a court or if there's a court order for records apart from somebody giving their express permission for me to share information elsewhere. That's a legally protected standard, um, except for those those few ex exceptions I mentioned, which is you know, something unique to that relationship. Okay, so this is really important. Um, we talk about the ADHD lens. So um, it's a coaching process and partnership. Um, and um, one of the ways we look at this from a life coaching is behavioral markers. Um, there is confidentiality. There's a partnership of equanimity, but it comes with that ADHD lens. And that ADHD lens says that our coaching partner is we're going to create an agenda based on your understanding of your own ADHD, how it shows up situationally, how it shows up emotionally, how it shows up behaviorally, how it shows up in terms of strengths, not weakness, how it shows in terms of your awareness of accessing positive emotion, understanding how your brain works, understanding emotional intelligence, your ability to pause and pay attention and identify the emotion as it's occurring. Only one third of the world has that skill and it's even more pervasive. And uh, research has come out that says emotional intelligence and emotional regulations are huge challenges for people with ADHD. So the coaching partnership has to begin with a improved self-awareness of how their ADHD manifests in both challenges and strengths, starting with the strengths to inspire and activate their brain to move forward. And it's conducted via, we were doing virtual technology before the name virtual technology was even invented. Coaching is done all over the world, was done on telephone lines and training was done. Now uh, we do training with Zoom-like technology. Well, all the different processing modalities are used and experiential learning is used in the training. But the coaching sessions, which are a disciplined coaching conversation about moving that client forward uh, based on collaboration and understanding of their ADHD is very powerful because it can be done in the comfort of your home using Zoom technology, using all the different uh, visual auditory, conceptual kinds of modalities, and um, it's been successful for years. Therapy is actually moving into the realm of what we've been doing for a long time. So we're very experienced at this, but most importantly, I wanna emphasize the fact that it's about empowering the client to make their own decisions based on their new understanding and their new awareness of their ADHD and implementing a completely different perspective of focusing on impairments and learning to change that, you know, Russ used the word patterns. We identify the patterns that have not been working well and encourage and support their ability to change those patterns by focusing on the ones that are knowings, not beliefs, knowings of memories that they can access. And in these memories, they can access their different learning modalities, their different strengths, their different energies, but the one thing we do in coaching that nobody else does is we create prompts, key devices, visually, auditory, conceptually, to remind them, what is it that I have to pay attention that's going to activate my brain in a positive way because they forget? So this relationship of collaboration, this relationship of working with a, an, a certified coach that's been trained in the understanding of neuroscience, the brain, how the brain works, the ADHD brain, the situations, the emotions, the actions, all those things have to be uh, part of the training. And only an ADHD coach can do that in terms of empowering that person to move forward with understanding your unique brain wiring and integrating the best 
of who they are. Yeah, just briefly on my edge, on, on my side. Um, yeah, there probably is at least a little bit of perceived power in equity at the outset and maybe still stigma as, associated with seeing a shrink or whatever. Um, but that usually a good therapist is going to put that to rest once you start, like I said, the collaborative empiricism and the accurate empathy and just looking at, hey, what do you want to accomplish? How do we get there? Um, and there is a, a phrase called invisible psychologists. People who are really interested in doing psychology but don't want to have to go get a psychology degree or a doctorate. Um, and that can be that can be I, I think it's very good how the science of psychology is getting out there into and I find it fascinating behavioral economics where there's a lot of overlap and I think really invigorating and interesting um, and relevant and jazzes me up about things in my field. But also there are times where people, uh, you know, uh, are irresponsibly planned therapist where they shouldn't. And I'm not mm. saying that about coaches, but I'm saying like maybe some other things, they're sort of the gurus out there. Um, and yeah, I think we're using, both of us are going back to the empowerment. Um, the goal of CBT for adult ADHD, like I'll tell people, we're not trying to create a sea of automatons saying, hey, use your planner at 8 a.m., eat a high fiber breakfast and go forth and do. <laughs> um, no, it's it's making informed decision, the right of self-determination. Um, hey, what and I'm a big believer in multifinality. There are many different ways to achieve a positive outcome. So what works for me may not work for you. OK, now we're going to really give you very in the most uh, productive, efficient and concise manner that I possibly can. These are what are called the pack. You see in the bold type, these are considered what are called the pack essentials. This is the structure of the ADHD coaching process. First, when a coach and client meet, there has to be an environment of safety. And that is co-created by the coach and the client because the coach has a, a deep understanding of how the ADHD brain works and how it manifests. They have a deep understanding of the mindset of an ADHD adult individual, and they have to be encouraging and accepting without any judgment. And they do this in a very compassionate way. In the word compassion is the word compass. The compass of a coach's passion is to empower that person through collaboration, you see that next poll, through collaboration to create an agenda, a focus that's aligned with who they are as human beings, the sources of motivation. So if I'm a creative, kind, socially intelligent, um, critical thinking individual, and I don't express my creativity and kindness in what I do, then what I do is going to fall by its wayside. That in fact, what we're teaching uh, and, and empowering a client with ADHD to understand is their own definition of integrity. In the word integrity is the word integrate. We are integrating in the coaching session a deeper understanding that having ADHD does not mean you're broken. It means you have a wonderfully creative, and by the way, research shows that individuals with ADHD are more creative. And what does creativity mean? Um, there are three criteria for that, which I can't get into, but there is an ADHD mindset for creativity. And that is something that needs to be expressed if that's who I am, I'm a creative, socially intelligent, kind and loving individual, and I'm not expressing that and what I do, their ADHD is going to be exacerbated. And that means active listening, hearing the language, hearing the experience, hearing what they're saying and mirroring it and reflecting it back to them because we're possibly the first person. I've often heard from my clients, you know, David, you're the first person in my life that's actually understood my ADHD that's actually been able to concisely mirror back and reflect back things that I was saying in my mind that I didn't even know. And you were the first one to encourage me to explore and discover what possibilities could I have? If I envision a life that I could live based on the strengths and the knowings and the memory of what I've done successfully and pause to pay attention to that because it's a challenge of pausing and coaching brings that pausing in and begins to explore and discover through powerful questioning, where in the back of your memory are there situations, experiences, where you expressed the essence of who you are in those signature character strengths, 
What are the memories that are aligned with that? And we begin to dissect that individually, every piece of that experience. And it's in that experience that they actually begin to feel the energy, the enthusiasm, and the positive emotion of those positive memories that have been buried, where they get the confidence to think about what's possible. What if I could let go of my anxiety? What if I could let go of my rumination that occurs as a hyper focus of negative automatic thoughts that I can't shift out of? What if I could pause and pay attention to the prompts that remind me that picture that I look at of me in that picture that automatically, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. But it's also worth a thousand positive emotions that in that ability, I can begin to create a possible picture of purpose that I could begin to take my first steps of action towards and action and growth are what really ADHD coaching is also about. Because when I know my ADHD and I understand what's been getting in the way and I can get it out of my way, the ADHD coach works with the client to say, why don't we focus on those things that are the best in you, not the worst in you. Let's focus on those things that are innate performance strengths but those performance strengths will not manifest until you understand the situations and the experiences that are the source of motivation to integrate those performance strengths, they will die. Just like you can focus on something temporarily, you can't sustain it without the ability to find out your sources of inspiration, positive emotion, and the strengths that are expressed in it. So action and growth, it's not fixed, your brain is not fixed, your brain has infinite possibilities and your ability to manifest those possibilities through an understanding through the coaching process is the foundation for exponential growth for a person with ADHD. It gives them the confidence and the ability to use a contextual memory and access it. And the coach helps them access it, dissect it and begin to implement it in their lives. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy offers a structured approach to psychotherapy with you know, mutually agreed upon or actually client-driven goal setting. How can this be helpful today? What are you trying to achieve? And both in an individual session and across sessions, getting an understanding of that Socratic inquiry. Uh, the, the model for that, oh man, this is old school, but the show Columbo <laughs> with sort of the bumbling um, uh, detective who would just sort of ask questions and sort of find inconsistencies. Um, just, but, it, but you know, it, 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 it's not as adversarial, not as, as adversarial. It's only partially adversarial with clients. No, it, it, it's more empathic and collaborative. It's sort of like, yeah, what do you want to achieve? What gets in the way? And, and what have you tried? And hey, what do you think, you know, got in the way of that working, whatever, and sort of finding potential solutions, at least things to try. So the between sessions action and the case conceptualization is a way to, especially with more complex cases, understand how old experiences, you develop almost like a food poisoning reaction to some things, some goals that you want. But if they were frustrating before, there may be an automatic visceral emotional reaction like dread that that also makes something that may be a challenging task, like writing a paper for a class, that's another layer of difficulty that needs to be accounted for and somehow addressed and worked through. So all the different intervention domains and ultimately for my money, the implementation strategies, but as well as the interpersonal domain, like using, asking for help when need be. Independent functioning doesn't mean we have to operate alone and advocating for needs and, and support and fulfilling personal roles. And the therapeutic alliance, again, sitting across from somebody who gets it. Um, and not that that's what, hey, we, I wanna tell you what you know. No, it's sort of like that can empathize. And I think like Dave was saying, elaborate on things that somebody goes, yeah, that's it. That's what it's like. Um, so. That's it, it. It's not an end all be all to itself, but it's an important platform for having that safe place to do this. Behavior change is difficult. This difficult work. So i um, going to go through quickly the benefits. You know, um, the benefits are it's a solid structure. 
but it's a flexible structure. The pack essentials that I just showed you, it's a dance. Think of it as, you, you know, you learn how to do the waltz. But once you learn how to do the waltz really well, you can freelance. You can go wherever you want. And that's what the coaching process is. It's meeting the client where they're dancing right now, but it's also empowering them to create their own dance steps. And if you look at the first area, what we find is in good coaching, and Russ makes a great point, two points. One is coaching is part of comprehensive treatment. It's not the answer all. It's, it's, it's a very important modality and helping a client move forward that, you know, if they're stuck in, in, in an automatic negative thought that they can't move forward, I'm not going to deal with that. I'm going to send them to Russ because he's trained in that. But in terms of self-control and self-efficacy, we know, and there's been research. Actually, Russ was part of the research uh, and, and helped support us in um, putting together the research results and uh, putting together a, a poster abstract on young adults at Tulane University with pre and post coaching that um, had significant improvements in self-efficacy, there, that, which means they had more confidence in their abilities to move forward and self-control, the ability to pause and pay attention, the ability to discern and make better decisions. And from this is we know that um, a lot of our clients, when they know the sources of their inspiration, you know, motivation is a word that cannot easily be defined. Motivation has to be defined in the specific sources like inspiration, what inspires me, like strengths, like character strengths, like the things that express the authentic, genuine self. What coaching does is it helps that person become more self-aware and confident in expressing their genuine, authentic selves. They're finally becoming somebody that they know who they are and what makes them tick and not trying to be somebody else that they've told they should be based on a story. What coaching is, you know, therapy talks about schemas. In coaching, we talk about what's the story the client is telling themselves. And in that story, how do their executive functions work? What processing modalities do they use to take in information, to make sense of information? And do they use their executive function strengths and um, sources of inspiration in a way that expresses their natural selves. Because what we find is mm -hmm. if we don't empower them to go into that place, uh, that foundation, that genuine expression of themselves uh, and the character strengths that express that, what they choose to do will ultimately fail. That they have to understand the personality ingredients of what makes them tick. And in that, um, what we're finding through research, one important thing is that the, nat the, the weaknesses of ADHD can, in fact, in the right situations, be strengths. Hyperfocus can turn into flow. Uh, impulsivity, you know, Ned Hollowell says uh, creativity is impulsivity gone right. Well, through the research that Russ did with us, we were able to focus on research that now has come out in the last five years that conclusively provides very strong evidence that there are three criteria for the mindset of an adult with ADHD. And they are divergent thinking, conceptual expansion, and overcoming knowledge constraints. And when we see those three things in a coaching session, I'm going to work very hard with my client to ask the questions, to ask the powerful questions that invite that client to go in an area that they already have a pattern of strength that they've buried to go express that creativity, to go express that social intelligence, to go express that critical thinking, but only in the unique way that they do it. And coaches have that lens. And without that ADHD lens, in much the way that Russ has a lens from a therapeutic perspective, Without that ADHD lens that he has, and it's a very powerful one, listen to the metaphor that he describes and the examples that he gives. That's the beautiful thing that we share in our professions is we can share those kinds of strategies that can work in either realm. And in terms of CBT, I'll be quick, and then, David, I'll just jump to one, and that'll be our wrap-up slide. Or, yep. or um, I, I, I'd say <clears> – <throat> A benefit, if I had to boil it down with the CBT for adult ADHD, the sessions give a prolongation. I think this is 
all therapy sessions do this. You put a pause button on life for an hour and you really get to, it's inhibitory rather than responding, it's pausing. And just like with the unfolding of the executive functions, with that pause, you're able to act with intention. Now, it may be planning for acting outside the therapy. Oh, hopefully it is for living outside the therapy room. Um, so that prolongation, then I think what, what I, how I view it as working, we try to identify these high yield pivot points for all the interventions. For a college student, it might be getting to their first class or even getting up and hitting the shower. Not that it's a guarantee for the rest of the day, but they just exponentially increase the likelihood to get to their first class. For somebody else, it might be transitioning. Okay, after this meeting, I need to work on this report so I can get it done before the weekend because I want to spend time with my family over the weekend. It's how do we bundle all those things together to increase the likelihood that you work on the report and maybe factoring in, okay, if you don't get as far as you intend to, how are you going to adapt to that? <clears throat> and it could be positive things like doing the exercise, even if you've had a less than productive day. All of these are making the treatment relative to outside the consulting room. What difference is this going to make out there? And that's the, the overall functioning and well-being more than the symptoms, which symptom improvement is great. And that's, that can be often what the medications specialize in. Um, and that's where medications can often interact well with both of these approaches, make them work better. Um, but these things ultimately is in the service of, and medications alone can lead to functional improvements. Um, but um, very often people lead another, a little more boost. So we'll finish with the, the overlapping benefits and, and future collaborative directions. Well, uh, tremendous benefits, at least from coaching and CBT. I, I'm going to be perfectly upfront with you. If not for us, as opposed to the last hour where he's been making yeah, stuff. But up. Been, yeah, which I, it's all been made up stuff. Um, but now I'm going to get to the real facts. Okay. Um, is that Russ and collaboration with Russ and I, Russ has been instrumental in creating a foundation of statistical analysis and understanding, but from a perspective of where I could bring a concept to him and he could look at the, the research, uh, uh, the research implications and methodology and how to do it in a way that I could not. And I've learned a tremendous amount of research. And through that, we've actually done a few wonderful research projects together. One of them is the VIA Character Strengths, which uh, was a poster. We actually got an award at AppSart for one of the best posters on what are the character strengths in adults with ADHD. And um, it was, and then also the pre and post study at Tulane University, uh, where four of our coaches that were trained at the academy um, instituted ADHD coaching at the university. Uh, and we did it with neurotypicals compared to ADHD um, individuals, college, young adult. Uh, individuals and self-efficacy and self-control were up. But out of that, those research projects, sometimes you do research and you begin to see uh, areas that you would hope which become significantly stronger. And what Russ taught me is, no, David, you can't say it's significantly stronger if the numbers aren't there. But within those areas that weren't as strong, like creativity, um, and uh, it was almost statistically significant, but what that did uh, even though it didn't meet the criteria for being statistically significant, it gave me an open invitation to begin to look at what research is out there that um, supports the idea that adults with ADHD and kids and children have a more creative mindset than neurotypicals. And because of the research that we did at VIA, I had my lens out for that kind of research, and it began to show up. That's through the work of Russ. We've also, and because of that, I understand that these three criteria that I've mentioned before are exceptionally important in identifying creativity. Hyper focus, for example, was also another thing that we made the assumption that hyper focus and ADHD go hand in hand. Well, we might assume that anecdotally, but research has just come out to say that hyper focus is. And lastly, um, there was no really real positive attribute research that was focused on the attributes and what's the best in ADHD coaches until the last five years where positive psychology research came out um, 
on adults with ADHD, and this is what it said. Uh, it came up with wonderful attributes like cognitive dynamism, cognitive dynamism, creativity and hyper-focus go together to show an exuberance and a positive energy that cannot be shown in individuals who do not have ADHD. So the collaboration of Russ was twofold. One, he supported us with statistical analysis, working with met met methodology. And secondly, he's a great source for me to uh, process ideas and say, Dave, this will work, it won't work. Um, and lastly, the cognitive distortion research that Russ did was foundational for helping coaches understand that perfectionism is not just a cognitive issue in your head, it's also theoretically a self-regulation issue. That if you're not feeling right and you're not in the perfect mood, that doesn't mean you shouldn't push yourself a little bit to act because you know that certain sources like calling a good friend can change that. So we're deeply indebted to the collaboration which Russ did and we couldn't have done it without him, but it also has expanded and broadened our curriculum and our ADHD lens. As we get ready to field questions, I'll just say quickly, uh, being around David reminds me to draw on the positive psychology and Martin Seligman studied under Dr. Beck and that there have been studies um, of CBT protocols well, there, where they will integrate between sessions co coaching check-ins. I'm sure it's not a full assortment of coaches. It's more like a encouragement to follow through on the recommendations, but that, that would, you know, expanding it to more... Um, by the book coaching, that would be an interesting collaboration where one could support the other. So now we're ready for questions. Yes, we are. 12 seconds. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much, both of you. This was um, very thorough, at times head spinning, but I know that our listeners got a lot out of it because we have received more than 250 questions now given oh, that we have we'll, okay we'll just stay on and answer them all for you my in 30 minutes yes. no no maybe no we don't know yep, yet maybe <laughs> be. yes okay done thank you so much exactly. um <laughs> given, yeah. given the, the three minutes that we have remaining right. um I have a couple that we can hit really quick that I think will be um, straight up for you. But my proposal would be, may I send you some of these uh, excellent questions that we have received during the Q&A and get some answers from you offline so that we can make that available um, to our listeners? Yes, David is available to answer all your questions. Wonderful. I had a feeling oh, you would that's say so that. funny because <laughs> I've already put an email out sending all the questions to Russ. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. let you guys duke that out. But the, the <laughs> number one question that we have received is Will we have where would you where <laughs> would you go to find accredited professionals? I did find paaccoaches.org um, as one resource. I'm wondering um, what on the CBT side where you would go um as a starting point for people who are just beginning their research. You know what, Chad has some, um, but people sign up for that, so it may not be all inclusive. Research the major adult ADHD programs. Our group at the University of Pennsylvania, Harvard has a program, Duke University, University of North Carolina, UCLA and USC, I think. Um, I'm sure I'm blanking on some, um, and there are some international, like the UK Adult ADHD Network. So you, you just have to do a little um, internet search and looking for adult ADHD programs. Even if that one's not near you, you can sort of do a regional six degrees of Kevin Bacon to find somebody um, <laughs> who might be available. Um, yeah. okay. um, on, the coach, so, on the coaching side, in addition to PAC, uh, mm -hmm. the Academy... Uh, all our coaches are certified through an accredited program. And what I would suggest you do, um, no matter where you get your coaching references from, make sure that you check the credentials. Uh, we're accredited. Mentor Coaching is another one. We're the, two of the only ones. And then wherever you go to PAC, P-A-A-C, and look at this, the actual credentials that are given to certified coaches uh, from accredited schools and look at the Academy, adca.com, and Mentor Coaching for their credentials. If they don't have those credentials, it, that means they have not been vetted out and their training has not been done 
uh, based on approval for an accredited program. Okay, very important note. So um, we are at 2.30, so we are going to wrap up, but I want to let everyone listening uh, know, rest assured, that we have all of your questions. I will be um, consolidating them and, and pulling them together, and, and we'll get some answers to those back to you. But um, I would also highly recommend downloading the slides. They are just packed full of really valuable information that I think could be a resource that you refer back to. But for now, I want to wrap up just with our great thanks, um, both to, to Russ and David for this excellent um, presentation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I do hope that um, the rest of you will, will keep in mind um, our ongoing webinar series um, with Attitude. We offer these on uh, just about a weekly basis. Um, they're always free of charge, and um, we're happy, especially now in ADHD Awareness Month, to be offering um, great resources. Our next one is October 15th, How Stress and Trauma Affect ADHD in Children of All Colors. Um, so we hope you can join us with uh, Dr. Brown at that time. For now, thank you so much for today, um, and uh, happy ADHD Awareness Month. <laughs>